I feel like technologically we're going to be regressing quite a bit for this one. Um, not least of all because the title of my presentation came from a extremely forgettable 2011 movie starring Matt Damon. Um, I'll give people a moment to get situated. Um, yeah, so this is this is less of a of a uh, tech presentation, maybe even a uh, a personal confessional one. Um, last year, I was in something of a midlife crisis. I had a new job that I wasn't excited about and was struggling to feel invested in. I'm sure no one here can relate. Uh, the pandemic had ravaged my social network, and I was trying really hard to manually pick up the scattered pieces while working remotely from a lonely studio apartment in Oakland, California. And it was in this context that I saw a story on Twitter making the rounds among my map nerd friends. Maybe you saw it. Uh, this guy, Andy Nosell, the third owner of a small map store in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, wanted to give away his map store to someone he deemed worthy so that he could retire and the venerable institution founded in 1953 could live on. I sent him an email. He liked it. I flew across the country to visit, and then he offered me the keys. I spent four months agonizing about whether I should actually do it. Um, these, these comments are worth reading. Uh, you're tweeting from the map place in Rhode Island, right? <laughs> we will happily sponsor a pizza and beer night, the grand opening. That's uh, Amir from, uh, from soar.earth. Uh, I still haven't cashed in on that yet. Um, <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, and, uh, and I said, yes, uh, I am Charlie Bucket, and this is my chocolate factory. Um, I took the reins last October. I moved across the country, and since then I've fixed up the store and revamped the website and brought in new stock. I've been really busy. And now I'd hoped that I'd learned enough by now that maybe I could share more with you today and, and about what I, <laughs> and I, I hope I won't feel let down by, I hope no one will feel let down by how much is still uncertain. Most small businesses don't succeed, and the ones that do tend to take over a year to show signs that they're onto something. So it's hard to say with any confidence at this stage of the game how accurate the insights I'm about to share with you are, but uh, I'd like to share a little bit about my journey so far. Um, the business that I walked into uh, was a straight retail service found in 1953. The business model is as simple as it can be. You buy maps from Rand McNally National Geographic, you put them on the shelves, you sell them at a markup. Value added was provided in the form of framing, laminating and mounting images to foam core, and pa foam core panels. Um, the big competition was malls, big box stores and other retailers. And then the early 2000s, uh, around MapQuest, uh, the business went online, which seemed like the way to go. Um, by the mid-2010s, the business was over 80% online sales, and by the time the pandemic had driven many small businesses under, the Map Center was in a holding pattern. It was a retiree's hobby. It was not a business. And it was in this state that I first saw the Map Center, and I hated it. It was truly awful. The outdated maps, the aged postcards, it all felt like what I'd find on the floor mats of my mom's 1994 Dodge Caravan. It was an aging business for an aging customer base that refused to change. There were wall maps of the US and the world. There were a few maps of Rhode Island. Some of them were downloaded directly from the DOT and printed in-house. Most of them were laminated on a foam core backing. They looked cheap. It was disorganized and hostile to visitors because it was doing the vast majority of its business online anyway. It didn't have to be presentable. The intersection of people who still bought roadmaps and people who use the internet seemed really small. But the owner was still reliably breaking even, and if this guy was breaking even and he had a slick operation, like I'd be done for. But if this was a disaster and he was doing all right, I figured there was plenty of low-hanging fruit that I could actually go after. Um, I planned a hard pivot that would capitalize on the business's age, legacy, and physical storefront location. I mean, everyone and their cousin is drop shipping out of their garage. If I had a brick and mortar location eating up overhead, I better start making it an interesting place to actually visit. A map store in 2024 is kind of weird. Let's market that. It could be books and toys and crafts and the physical manifestation of Nasus. I make maps. My friends make maps. Let's remind the public that cool shit isn't all antiques. I did a rebrand. Where have you been all your life? This is the pole star, pole star that I'm navigating by. So. Here's some lessons that I've been learning along the way. Number one, selling information. One of my biggest roles at the Map Center is as a cart cartographic sommelier. Lots of people want information, and they don't know how to ask for it. They announce, they just come in, they say, I want a map. And then I have to ask the inevitable question, like, of what? What scale? Is it a road map? Is it a map of parks? And people, like, have never been asked those questions before. They have questions. They expect me to get, deliver them an artifact that will tell them the things about the place that they want, usually either uh, their home or where they're going on vacation, whatever they can get. 
Uh, and I think this is tremendously relevant to the state of the map crowd because it implies that there's a map market for what we do that is not adequately served already. There are a lot of people who have questions and libraries, government services, internet search are not answering them. So digital mapping is a mass market for a huge number of people, but there's still a very significant minority that have no idea what we do. And of course, I don't wanna be the human manifestation of Google for this demographic. It's not gonna be worth my time. For my purposes, a broad market that will be alive in 10 years I can't sell information because what the public wants to know is already available on the internet for free. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Contemporary print roadmaps are overwhelmingly selling information and when they do this, they limit their potential tremendously. That's because people associate a map with objective information made by an authority. How could the state border be anything else? To most people, a map is not a story with a point of view, it's a fungible reflection of a universal reality. The more informative and efficient a map is to its stated purpose, the less likely people remember the brand it came from. An informative map often disappears and becomes very hard to market. Now, I think there's an exception to this, which is that information can lead to an experience. Um, hiking and travel guides still have a healthy demand. There's a lot of interest internationally in tourism trails, and there are a ton of web maps about biking through Australia, cruising the Danube, or hiking through South America. Right now, there isn't much print media about these trails, and I think that's a major opportunity. Uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, the next thing I learned is, is that selling stuff is a thing that you can actually do. Um, you can sell physical materials, home decor, the experience of being off the grid in the woods with a real paper map, a board map that you can stick pins in, a magnetic board. Paper alone is usually a financial loser. The more it looks like a durable good, the better. Put it in a frame, add a cardboard backing, laminate it, whatever, make your stuff look substantial, and people will feel like it's a better value, even if it's more expensive. If it's on a table or wall or paper or a beach ball, all the better. Um, this is a picture of my vacuum laminator table. It is really old and really scary, um, but it does put really large images onto foam core backing. And for a lot of people, that's a, a really important value add. Not a lot of people are doing this. Uh, it's not gonna make anybody rich, but it might be able to keep me above water for a little while. Um, a big part of my vision was modeling the store after a used record store. Um, people like music. People like having a physical receipt for the music. This is music as stuff. Um, stickers available in the lobby. Um, the last one is that no one wants a framed infographic. No one will buy a print copy of a beautiful map accompanying a story in the Washington Post, no matter how good it is. A print map has to tell a story that people want to revisit day after day after day if it's gonna be in their home. This suggests the classics. Most people can name an artist. Very few members of the public can name a cartographer. So if you want someone to care about it for reasons other than because it's old, you need to tell a story about it. Antique map stores are fairly common, and by and large, they're doing fine. They don't sell up-to-date information. They're a story, a symbol for place. If you have an antique original, you can charge whatever you want for it. Um, selling original pieces to wealthy people is a good bet in this country, and older people have more expendable income, which is why they can afford an expensive prestige piece. Um, but again, I'm kind of walking away from this because I want people who are still alive to make money. Um, I know, like all of you know, that we're in a golden age of cartography and I want the public to know that too. So that's why I'm kind of walking away from this known good seller. We'll find out if that's a good idea. Um, last, we gotta talk, like, who's, who's coming into a map store? So this is like a brief, brief demographic profile of my customers, uh, mostly older, uh, there are a lot of people that need paper maps because they struggle to adapt to digital technology. They're looking for answers and they come to me so I can answer them for, the, for them and because they need to tell somebody about how young people don't read maps anymore. <laughs> um, teachers use more digital, vis digital visual aids or scanned paper copies of public domain works and they're really not the market they used to be. Um, pay teachers more. Um, Families like having alternatives to screen time for educational development and they want their kids to feel part of a community. We do really well with families. Um, online urbanists are nerds who will snap up any transit-oriented maps you have. Look around. Um, sailors have practical requirements for paper charts. Rhode Island is the ocean state. We love a good nautical chart. Most people want to see their houses. Um, some people want geographic features like water and signs of erosion. Um, the office background map is largely dated, but there's still some demand for sort of like the prestige piece that makes you look fancy and intellectual. The travel guide book isn't totally dead, but struggling to stay alive, and most of the people who are, you know, adventurous people, they're getting their stuff from online anyway. So there's some limited market for, for travel guides that I've found it's hard to do in a brick and mortar. Um, the biggest demographic that I feel like is neglected is immigrants and the children of immigrants. Um, 
if you want a demographic that cares about geography, look for people who are nostalgic, frustrated, hopeful, and deeply invested in the places that their families have lived. Look to your local diaspora. Now, I'm new to this, but I'm really looking forward to expanding my Caribbean collection and hosting more maps from people of color. It's not just an equity issue, it's just good business. Um, the next thing is um, you have to be specific. In the specific is the universal. Any given person has dozen or so places that mean something to them that they want a map of, but no one wants a generic map of the United States. There's a temptation to make a map of the world or the US because many people can relate to it, but then the map gets so big and broad and bland that no one wants to open their wallet for it. It's for someone else. Um, this is a really fun one. This is, this is done by a local artist. It has all this really fun like marginalia about like weird stuff that happens in Rhode Island. Uh, one of them is like, this is the house where uh, they used to set out um, whiskey and gingerbread for travelers that came by. You know, is that important information? No, but it makes me feel really special about the place that I live in. Um, that's sort of building a, an emotional product and storyline that I think can actually survive in this, in this economic environment. Um, this is a piece by Scott Lucier. Um, unfortunately, he's not here. Uh, he lives in um, uh, Bridgewater, Mass. Um, he's been using OSM data to create contemporary maps that look old. This is an antique that you can find your house on. These are doing really well. They're specific enough that people can find their small town represented in a way that does honor to it. Um, and if you show someone from a very small town something that reflects them personally, um, they're gonna buy it. Um, last, um, I'm gonna try not to go over, sorry, Alan. Um, uh, selling stuff online sucks. Um, to, to be brief here, um, a handful of people are making lots of money and the vast majority of people who are entering the marketplace are not. This is like Twitch, uh, this is like Substack. Um, this, you know, there are gonna be a handful of people that are gonna end up like Mr. Beast and 99.9% .9 of everyone else is not. So um, I don't really see my competition necessarily being like makers who make things on the internet. I think of myself as competing with Etsy, uh, which is great because most people don't like Etsy. Um, it's not a pleasing um, consumer experience. It's not particularly kind to the people who are making things and trying to distribute things. Um, it sounds kind of weird, but like enshittification has progressed so far um, that a brick and mortar store is actually competitive now um, with the crappy online retail experience. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> Um, I also have some bonus lessons here. Um, if you find yourself selling some maps out in public, um, bring a magnifying glass, not because um, people will immediately think of like needing something to magnify to look at your map. They will pick up the magnifying glass first and they will try to look for something that they can look at very closely. And if your map is adjacent, they will look, use the magnifying glass to look at your map. Um, most bookstores sell many copies of just a few, pardon me, most bookstores sell many copies of just a few titles, but you can't run a business that sells hundreds of copies of the same book. Um, that's a vending machine. Um, a certain amount of bulk around the edges provides charm. It gives the patron the impression that they're, um, they're actually in some place that's special. Having weird stuff, even if it doesn't sell, makes the Map Center more exciting to visit, more fun to browse, and more memorable. Just make sure that not everything in the store is a lost leader. Um, the last thing I wanna say here is that everyone loves a map store. Everyone loves the idea of a map. The challenging reality is that fewer people buy them. Every day someone tells me they love the map center and that they're so glad it's still around. My store is special and it's special to other people. It's worth protecting. It's worth moving across the country for. Maybe I'll reorganize a 501c3. Maybe things are just about to turn around. I don't know. But I think more broadly, there's a hunger for curious things. We are starved for stimulation that feels real for us. More and more, I'm realizing that my goal is to create the unhinged curiosity and wonder of the inter internet circa like 2005. People wanna be dazzled by obsessive weirdos who love what they do. They wanna live in a world where Willy Wonka's factory is real and they don't, even if they don't buy the candy. And I'm gonna do my best to keep that alive. Um, in, in closing, uh, if you make maps and you think you might, and if you think someone might want to buy them, uh, don't let them rot on your hard drive. Send them to me, I will print them, I will sell them in my store, I will get you paid. Not a lot, <laughs> but if you want a portfolio piece and you want something that is physical, tangible, that you can smell and touch, I guarantee you there's no feeling quite like seeing your work leak into reality this way. Um, please take me up on this. Um, lastly, um, last year I had a choice, to stay in Oakland, a city I love, or move to Pawtucket and do something a little bit stupid. I'm so lucky I got to have these two great choices in front of me. As my final bit of subjective insight, if you find yourself in a similar situation, I hope you do whatever makes the better story. Thanks. <laughs>